Good evening, and welcome to Dr. Peace Theater. My name is Dr. Dennis Business, and tonight, tonight we will continue our dive into the second short story contained within the pages of the Bachman books, The Long Walk. When we last left Luke Garrity, he was getting to know the people around him and, my God, mentally coping with what is in front of him. There were a hundred, and now there's ninety-eight. We lost Curly to that really bad Charlie horse, and then we lost Ewing, who, against better judgment, I guess, decided to wear tennis shoes on the long walk. And the major has a list of tips for the long walk. One, conserve energy whenever necessary. And another is do not wear tennis shoes to the long walk. So, we pick up with Luke Garrity and his 97 competitors with Chapter 3. It was three o'clock when the first drops of rain fell on the road, big and dark and round. The sky overhead was tattered and black, wild and fascinating. Thunder clapped hands somewhere above the clouds. A blue fork of lightning went to earth somewhere up ahead. Garrity had donned his coat shortly after Ewing had gotten his ticket, and now he had zipped it and turned up its collar. Harkness, the potential author, had carefully stowed his notebook in a baggie. Barkovich had put on a yellow vinyl rain hat. There was something incredible about what it did to his face, but you would have been hard put to say just what. He peered out from beneath it like a truculent lighthouse keeper. There was a stupendous crack of thunder. Here it comes, Olson cried. The rain came pouring down. For a few moments, it was so heavy that Garrity found himself totally isolated inside an undulating shower curtain. He was immediately soaked to the skin. His hair became a dripping pelt. He turned his face up to the rain, grinning. He wondered if the soldiers could see them. He wondered if a person might conceivably. While he was still wondering, the first vicious onslaught led up a little and he could see again. He looked over his shoulder at Stebbins. Stebbins was walking hunched over, his hands against his belly, and at first Garrity thought he might have a cramp. For a moment, Garrity was in the grip of a strong, panicky feeling. Nothing at all like he had felt when Curly and Ewing bought it. He didn't want Stebbins to fold up early anymore. Then, he saw Stebbins was only protecting the last half of his jelly sandwich, and he faced forward again feeling relieved. He decided Stebbins must have a pretty stupid mother not to wrap his goddamn sandwiches in foil, just in case of rain. Thunder cracked stridently, artillery practice in the sky. Garrity felt exhilarated, and some of his tiredness seemed to wash away with the sweat from his body. The rain came again, hard and pelting, and finally let off into a steady drizzle. Overhead, the clouds began to tatter. Pearson was now walking beside him. He hitched up his pants. He was wearing jeans that were too big for him, and he hitched up his pants often. He wore horned-rimmed glasses with lenses like the bottom of Coke bottles, and now he whipped them off and began to clean them on the tail of his shirt. He goggled in the myopic, defenseless way that people with poor eyesight have when their glasses are off. Enjoy your shower, Garrity? Garrity nodded. Up ahead, McVries was urinating. He was walking backwards while he did it, spraying the shoulder 
considerably away from the others. Garrity looked up at the soldiers. They were wet, too, of course, but if they were uncomfortable, they didn't show it. Their faces were perfectly wooden. I wonder what it feels like, he thought, just to shoot someone down. I wonder if it makes them feel powerful. He remembered the girl with the sign, kissing her, feeling her ass, feeling her smooth underpants under her pedal pushers. That had made him feel powerful. That guy back there sure doesn't say much, does he? Baker said suddenly. He jerked a thumb at Stebbins. Stebbins' purple pants were almost black now that they were soaked through. No. No, he doesn't. McVries pulled a warning for slowing down too much to zip up his fly. They pulled even with him, and Baker repeated what he had said about Stebbins. He's a loner, so what? McVries said and shrugged. I think... Hey! Olsen broke in. It was the first thing he had said in some time, and he sounded queer. My legs feel funny. Garrity looked at Olsen closely and saw the seedling panic in his eyes already. The look of bravado was gone. How funny? He asked. Like the muscles are all turning baggy. Relax, McVries said. It happened to me a couple hours ago. It'll pass. Relief showed in Olsen's eyes. Does it? Yeah, sure it does. Olsen didn't say anything, but his lips moved. Garrity thought for a moment he was praying, but then he realized he was just counting his paces. Two shots rang out suddenly. There was a cry, then a third shot. They looked and saw a boy in a blue sweater and dirty white clam diggers lying face down in a puddle of water. One of his shoes had come off. Garrity saw he had been wearing white athletic socks. Hint number 12 recommended them. Garrity stepped over him, not looking too closely for holes. The word came back that the boy had died of slowing down. Not blisters or a charley horse. He had just slowed down once too often and got a ticket. Garrity didn't know his name or number. He thought the word would come back on that, but it never did. Maybe nobody knew. Maybe he had been a loner like Stebbins. Now, they were 25 miles into the long walk. The scenery blended into a continuous mural of woods and fields, broken by an occasional house or crossroads where, waving, cheering people stood in spite of the drying drizzle. One old lady stood frozenly beneath a black umbrella, neither waving nor speaking, nor smiling. She watched them go by with gimlet eyes. There was not a sign of life or movement about her, except for the wind-twitched hem of her black dress. On the middle finger of her right hand, she wore a large ring with a purple stone. There was a tarnished cameo at her throat. They crossed a railroad track that had been abandoned long ago. The rails were rusty and which grass was growing in the cylinders between the ties. Somebody stumbled and fell and was warned and got up and went on walking with a bleeding knee. It was only 19 miles to Caribou, but dark would come before that. No rest for the wicked, Garrity thought, and that struck him funny. He laughed. McFreeze looked at him closely. Getting tired? No, Garrity said. I've been tired for quite a while now. He looked at McVries with something like animosity. You mean you're not? McVries said, Just go on dancing with me like this forever, Garrity, and I'll never tire. We'll scrape our shoe on the stars and hang upside down from the moon. He blew Garrity a kiss and walked away. Garrity looked after him. He didn't know what to make of McVries. By a quarter of four, the sky had cleared, and there was a rainbow in the west, where the sun was setting, below gold-edged clouds. Slanting rays of the late afternoon sunlight 
colored the newly turned fields they were passing, making the furrows sharp and black, where they contoured around the long, sloping hills. The sound of the half-track was quiet, almost soothing. Garrity let his head drop forward and semi-dozed as he walked. Somewhere up ahead was Freeport. Not tonight or tomorrow, though. Lot of steps. Long way to go. He found himself still, with too many questions, and not enough answers. The whole walk seemed nothing but one looming question mark. He told himself that a thing like this must have some deep meaning. Surely it was so. A thing like this must provide an answer to every question. It was just a matter of keeping your foot on the throttle. Now, if he could only... He put his foot down in a puddle of water and started fully awake again. Pearson looked at him quizzically and pushed his glasses up on his nose. You know that guy that fell down and cut himself when we were crossing the tracks? Yeah. It was Zuck, wasn't it? Yeah, I heard he's still bleeding. How far to caribou, maniac? Somebody asked him. Garrity looked around. It was Barkovich. He had tucked his rain hat into his back pocket where it flapped obscenely. How the hell should I know? You live here, don't you? It's about 17 miles, McVries told him. Now go peddle your papers, little man. Barkovich put on his insulted look and moved away. He's some hot ticket, Garrity said. Don't let him get under your skin, McVries replied. Just concentrate on walking him into the ground. Okay, coach. McVries patted Garrity on the shoulder. You're going to win this one for the Gipper, my boy. It seems as if we've been walking forever, doesn't it? Yeah. Garrity licked his lips, wanting to express himself and not knowing how. Did you ever hear that bit about a drowning man's life passing before his eyes? I think I read it once or heard someone say it in a movie, he said. Have you ever thought that might happen to us? On the walk? McVries pretended to shudder. Christ, I hope not. Garrity was silent for a moment and then said, Do you think... Never mind, the hell with it. No, go on. Do do I think what? Do you think we could live the rest of our lives on this road? That's what I meant. The part we would have had if we hadn't... You know. McVries fumbled in his pocket and came up with a package of mellow cigarettes. Smoke? I don't. Neither do I, McVries said, and then put a cigarette into his mouth. He found a book of matches with a tomato sauce recipe on it. He lit the cigarette, drew smoke in, and coughed it out. Garrity thought of hint 10. Save your wind. If you smoke ordinarily, try not to smoke on the long walk. I thought I'd learn, McVries said defiantly. It's crap, isn't it? Garrity said sadly. McVries looked at him, surprised, and then threw the cigarettes away. Yeah, he said. I think it is. The rainbow was gone by four o'clock. Davidson, number eight, dropped back with them. He was a good-looking boy, except for the rash of acne on his forehead. That guy Zuck's really hurting, Davidson said. He had but a pack sack the last time Garrity saw him, but he noticed at some point Davidson had cast it away. Still bleeding? McVries asked. Like a stuck pig, Davidson shook his head. It's funny the way things turn out, isn't it? You fall down any other time, and you get a little scrape. He needs stitches. He pointed to the road. Look at that. Garrity looked and saw tiny dark spots on the drying hard top. Is that blood? It ain't molasses, Davidson said grimly. Is he scared? Olson asked in a dry voice. He says he doesn't give a damn, Davidson said. But I'm scared. His eyes were wide and gray. I'm scared for all of us. They kept on walking. Baker pointed out another Garrity sign. 
Hot shit, Garrity said without looking up. He was following the trail of Zuck's blood. Like Daniel Boone tracking a wounded Indian, it weaved slowly back and forth across the white line. McFreeze, Olson said. His voice has gotten softer in the last couple of hours. Garrity had decided he liked Olson, in spite of Olson's brass balls outer face. He didn't like to see Olson getting scared, but there could be no doubt that he was. What? McVries said. It isn't going away. That baggy feeling I told you about, it isn't going away. McVries didn't say anything. The scar on his face looked very white in the light of the setting sun. It feels like my legs could just collapse. Like a bad foundation. That won't happen, will it? Will it? Olson's voice had gotten a little shrill. McVries didn't say anything. Could I have a cigarette? Olson asked. His voice was low again. Yeah, man, you can keep the pack. Olson lit one of the mellows with practiced ease, cupping the match, and he thumbed his nose at one of the soldiers watching him from the half track. They've been giving me the old hairy eyeball for the last hour or so. They've got a sick sense about it. He raised his voice again. You like it? Don't you, fellas? You like it, right? That's goddamn it, isn't it? Several of the walkers looked around at him and then looked away quickly. Garrity wanted to look away, too. There was a hysteria in Olsen's voice. The soldiers looked at Olsen impassively. Garrity wondered if the word would go back on Olsen pretty quick and couldn't repress a shudder. By 4.30... They had covered 30 miles. The sun was half gone, and it had turned blood red on the horizon. The thunderheads had moved east, and overhead the sky was the darkening blue. Garrity thought about his hypothetical drowning man again. Not so hypothetical at that. The coming night was like a water that would soon cover them. A feeling of panic rose in his gullet. He was suddenly and terribly sure that he was looking at the last daylight in his life. He wanted it to stretch out. He wanted it to last. He wanted the dust to go on for hours. Warning. Warning number 100. Your third warning 100. Zuck looked around. There was a dazed, uncomprehending look in his eyes. His right pants leg was caked with dried blood. And then, suddenly, he began to sprint. He weaved through the walkers like a broken field runner carrying a football. He ran with that same dazed expression on his face. The half-track picked up speed. Zuck heard it coming and ran faster. It was a weird, shambling, limping run. The wound on his knee broke open again, and as he burst into the open ahead of the main pack, Garrity could see the drops of fresh blood splashing and flying from the cuff of his pants. Zuck ran up the next rise, and for a moment he was starkly silhouetted against the red sky. A galvanic black shape, frozen for a moment in mid-stride, like a scarecrow in full flight. Then he was gone, and the half-track followed. The two soldiers that had dropped off it trudged along with the boys, their faces empty. Nobody said a word. They only listened. There was no sound for a long time. An incredibly, unbelievably long time. Only a bird and a few early May crickets, and somewhere behind them, the drone of a plane. Then there was a single sharp report, a pause, then a second. Making sure, someone said sickly. When they got up over the rise, they saw the half-track sitting on the shoulder half a mile away. Blue smoke was coming out of its dual exhaust pipes. Of Zuck, there was no sign. No sign at all. Where's the Major? Someone screamed. The voice was on the raw edge of panic. It belonged to a bullet-headed boy, 
named Gribble, number 48. I want to see the Major, goddammit! Where is he? The soldiers walking along the edge of the road did not answer. No one answered. Is he making another speech? Gribble stormed. Is that what he's doing? Well, he's a murderer. That's what I think he is, a murderer. I, I'll tell him. You think I won't? I'll tell him to his face. I'll tell him right to his fucking face. In his excitement, he had fallen below the pace, almost stopping, and the soldiers became interested for the first time. Warning. Warning 48. Gribble faltered to a stop, and then his legs picked up speed. He looked down at his feet as he walked. Soon, they were up to where the half-track waited. It began to crawl along beside them again. At about 4.45, Garrity had supper. A tube of processed tuna fish, a few snappy crackers with cheese spread, and a lot of water. He had to force himself to stop there. You could get a canteen any time, but there would be no fresh concentrates until tomorrow morning at 9 o'clock. And he might want a midnight snack. Hell, he might need a midnight snack. It may be a matter of life and death, Baker said, but it sure ain't hurting your appetite any. Can't afford to let it, Garrity answered. I don't like the idea of fainting about 2 o'clock tomorrow morning. Now that was a genuinely unpleasant thought. You wouldn't know anything, probably. You wouldn't feel anything. You'd just wake up in eternity. Makes you think, doesn't it? Baker said softly. Garrity looked at him. In the fading daylight, Baker's face was soft and young and beautiful. Yeah, I've been thinking about a whole hell of a lot of things. Such as? Him. For one, Garrity said and jerked his head towards Stebbins, who was still walking along at the same pace he had been walking at when they started out. His pants were drying on him. His face was shadowy. He was still saving his last half sandwich. What about him? I wonder why he's here. Why he doesn't say anything. And whether he'll live or die. Garrity, we're all going to die. But hopefully not tonight, Garrity said. He kept his voice light, but a shudder suddenly wrecked him. He didn't know if Baker saw it or not. His kidneys contracted. He turned around, unzipped his fly, and began walking backwards. What do you think about that prize? Baker asked. I don't see much sense thinking about it, Garrity said, and began to urinate. He finished, zipped his fly, and turned around again, mildly pleased that he had accomplished the operation without drawing a warning. I think about it, Baker said dreamily. Not so much the prize itself as the money. All that money. Rich men don't enter the kingdom of heaven, Garrity said. He washed his feet, the only things that were keeping him from finding out if there really was a kingdom of heaven or not. Hallelujah, Olson said. There'll be refreshments after the meeting. Are you a religious fella? Baker asked Garrity. No, not particularly, but I'm no money freak. You might be if you grew up on potato soup and collards, Baker said. Side meat only when your daddy could afford the ammunition. That might make a difference, Garrity agreed, and then paused, wondering whether to say anything else. But it's never really the important thing. He saw Baker looking at him uncomprehendingly and a little scornfully. You can't take it with you. That's your next line, McVries said. Garrity glanced at him. McVries was wearing that irritating, slanted smile again. It's true, isn't it? He said. We don't bring anything into the world, and we sure as shit don't take anything out. Yeah, but the period between those two events is more pleasant in comfort, don't you think? McVries said. Oh, comfort shit, Garrity said. If one of those goons riding that overgrown Tonka toy over there shot you, no doctor in the world could revive you with a transfusion of 20s or 50s. 
I ain't dead, Baker said softly. Yeah, but you could be. Suddenly, it was very important to Garrity that he put this across. What if you won? What if you spent the next six weeks planning what you were going to do with the cash? Never mind the prize, just the cash. And what if the first time you went out to buy something, you got flattened by a taxi cab? Harkness had come over and was now walking beside Olson. Not me, babe, he said. First thing I'd do is buy a whole fleet of checkers. If I win this, I may never walk again. You don't understand, Garrity said, more exasperated than ever. Potato soup or sirloin tips, a mansion or a hovel. Once you're dead, that's it. They put you on a cooling board like Zuckert Ewing, and that's it. You're better to take it one day at a time, is all I'm saying. If people just took it one day at a time, they'd be a lot happier. Oh, such a goddamn golden flood of bullshit, McVree said. Is that so? Garrity cried. How much planning are you doing? Well, right now I've sort of adjusted my horizons, that's true. You bet it is, Garrity said grimly. The only difference is... We're involved in dying right now. Total silence followed that. Harkness took off his glasses and began to polish them. Olson looked a shade paler. Garrity wished he hadn't said it. He had gone too far. Then someone in the back said quite clearly, Here, here! Garrity looked around. Sure, it was Stebbins, even though he had never heard Stebbins' voice. But Stebbins gave no sign. He was looking down at the road. I guess I got carried away, Garrity muttered, even though he wasn't the one who had gotten carried away. That had been Zuck. Anyone want a cookie? He handed the cookies around, and it got to be five o'clock. The sun seemed to hang suspended halfway over the horizon. The earth might have even stopped turning. The three or four eager beavers who were still ahead of the pack had dropped back, until they were less than 50 yards ahead of the main group. It seemed to Garrity that the road had become a sly combination of upgrades, with no corresponding downs. He was thinking that if it was true, they'd all end up breathing through oxygen faceplates before long when his foot came down on a discarded belt of food concentrates. Surprised, he looked up. It had been Olson's. His hands were twitching at his waist there was a look of frowning surprise on his face. I dropped it, he said. I wanted something to eat, and I dropped it. He laughed, as if to show what a silly thing that had been. The laugh stopped abruptly. I'm hungry, he said. No one answered. By that time, everyone had gone by, and there was no chance to pick it up. Garrity looked back and saw Olson's food belt, laying across the broken passing line. I'm hungry, Olson repeated patiently. The Major likes to see someone who's raring to rip. Wasn't that what Olson had said when he came back from getting his number? Olson didn't look quite so raring to rip anymore. Garrity looked at the pockets of his own belt. He had three tubes of concentrate left, plus the snappy crackers and the cheese. The cheese was pretty cruddy, though. Here, he said, and gave Olson the cheese. Olson didn't say anything, but he ate the cheese. Musketeer, McVries said, with that same slanted grin. By 5.30, the air was smoky with twilight. A few early lightning bugs flitted aimlessly through the air. A ground fog had curdled milkily in the ditches and lower gullies of the fields. Up ahead, someone asked what happened if it got so foggy he walked off the road by mistake. Barkovich's unmistakable voice came back quickly and nastily. What do you think, Dumbo? Four gone, Garrity thought. Eight and a half hours on the road and only four gone. There was a small, pinched feeling in his stomach. I'll never outlast all of them, he thought. Not all of them. But on the other hand, why not? Someone had to. 
talk had faded with the daylight. The silence that set in was oppressive. The encroaching dark. The ground mist collecting into small curdled pools. For the first time it seemed perfectly real and totally unnatural. And he wanted either Jan or his mother, some woman. And he wondered what in the hell he was doing and how he ever could have gotten himself involved. He could not even kid himself that everything had not been up front, because it had been. And he hadn't even done it alone, because there were currently 95 other fools in this parade. The mucus ball was in his throat again, making it hard to swallow. He realized that someone up ahead was sobbing softly. He had not heard the sound begin, and no one had called his attention to it. It was as if it had been there all along. Ten miles to Caribou now, and at least there would be lights. The thought cheered Garrity a little. It was okay after all, wasn't it? He was alive, and there was no sense thinking ahead of time when he might not be. As McFreeze had said, it was all a matter of adjusting your horizons. At a quarter past six... The word came back on a boy named Traven, one of the early leaders who was now falling slowly back through the main group. Traven had diarrhea. Garrity heard it and couldn't believe it was true, but when he saw Traven, he knew that it was. The boy was walking and holding his pants up at the same time. Every time he squatted, he picked up a warning and Garrity wondered sickly why Traven didn't just let it roll down his legs. Better to be dirty than dead. Traven was bent over, walking like Stebbins with his sandwich, and every time he shuddered, Garrity knew that another stomach cramp was ripping through him. Garrity felt disgusted. There was no fascination in this, no mystery. It was a boy with a bellyache, and that was all and it was impossible to feel anything but disgust and a kind of animal terror. His own stomach rolled queasily. The soldiers were watching Traven very carefully, watching and waiting. Finally, Traven half squatted, half fell, and the soldiers shot him with his pants down. Traven rolled over and grimaced at the sky, ugly and pitiful. Someone retched noisily and was warned. It sounded to Garrity as if he was spewing up his belly. You'll go next, Harkness said in a businesslike way. Shut up, Garrity choked thickly. Can't you just shut up? No one replied. Harkness looked ashamed and began to polish his glasses again. The boy who vomited was not shot. They passed a group of cheering teenagers sitting on a blanket and drinking Cokes. They recognized Garrity and gave him a standing ovation. It made him feel uncomfortable. One of the girls had very large breasts. Her boyfriend was watching them jiggle as she jumped up and down. Garrity decided that he was turning into a sex maniac. Look at them Johoobies, Pearson said. Dear, dear, dear me. Garrity wondered if she was a virgin. Like he was. They passed by a still, almost perfectly circular pond, faintly misted over. It looked like a gently clouded mirror, and in the mysterious tangle of water plants growing around the edge, a bullfrog croaked hoarsely. Garrity thought the pond was one of the most beautiful things he had ever seen. This is one hell of a big state, Barkovich said someplace up ahead. That guy gives me a royal pain in my ass. McVree said solemnly. Right now, my one goal in life is to outlast him. Olson was saying a Hail Mary. Garrity looked at him, alarmed. How many warnings has he got? Pearson asked. None that I know of, Baker said. Yeah, but he doesn't look so good. At this point, none of us do, McVree said. Another silence fell. Garrity was aware for the first time 
that his feet hurt. Not just his legs, which had been troubling him for some time, but his feet. He noticed that he had unconsciously been walking on the outside of his soles, but every now and then he put a foot down flat and winced. He zipped his jacket all the way up and then turned the collar against his neck. The air was still damp and raw. Hey, over there, McVrie said cheerfully. Garrity and the others looked to the left. They were passing a graveyard situated atop a small grassy knoll. A field stone wall surrounded it, and now the mist was creeping slowly around the leaning gravestones. An angel with a broken wing stared at them with empty eyes. A nuthatch, perched atop a rust-flaking flag holder left over for some patriotic holiday, and looked over them, perkily. Our first boneyard, McVries said. It's on your side. Ray, you lose all your points. Remember that game? You talk too goddamn much, Olson said suddenly. What's wrong with graveyards? Henry, old buddy. A fine and favorite place, as the poet said. A nice watertight casket that just shut up. Oh, pickles, McVries said. His scar flashed very white in the dying daylight. You don't really mind the thought of dying, do you, Olson? Like the poet also said, it ain't the dying. It's the laying in the grave so long. Is that what's bugging you? McVries began to trumpet. Well, cheer up, Charlie. There's a brighter day come. Leave him alone, Baker said quietly. Why should I? He's busy convincing himself that he can crap out any time he feels like it. That if he just lays down and dies... It won't be as bad as everyone makes out. Well, I'm not going to let him get away with it. If he doesn't die, you will, Garrity said. Yeah, I'm remembering, McVries said, and gave Garrity his tight slanted smile. Only this time, there was absolutely no humor in it at all. Suddenly, McVries looked furious, and Garrity was almost afraid of him. He's the one that's forgetting. This turkey here. I don't want to do it anymore, Olson said hollowly. I'm sick of it. Raring to rip, McVrie said, turning on him. Isn't that what you said? Fuck it then. Why don't you just fall down and die then? Leave him alone, Garrity said. Listen, Ray. No, you listen. One bark of itch is enough. Let him do it his own way. No musketeers, remember? McVrie smiled again. Okay, Garrity, you win. Olson didn't say anything. He just kept picking them up and laying them down. Full dark had come by 6.30. Caribou, now only six miles away, could be seen on the horizon as a dim glow. There were few people along the road to see them into town. They seemed to have gone all home to supper. The mist was chilly around Ray Garrity's feet. It hung over the hills in ghostly limp banners. The stars were coming brighter overhead, Venus glowing steadily, the dipper in its accustomed place. He had always been good at constellations. He pointed out the Cassiopeia to Pearson, who only grunted. He thought about Jan, his girl, and felt a twinge of guilt about the girl he had kissed earlier. He couldn't remember exactly what the girl had looked like anymore, but she had excited him. Putting his hand on her ass like that had excited him. What would have happened if he had tried to put his hand between her legs? He felt a clock spring of pressure in his groin and that made him wince a little as he walked. Jan had long hair, almost to her waist. She was 16. Her breasts were not as big as those of the girl that had kissed him. He had played with her breasts a lot. It drove him crazy. She wouldn't let him make love to her, and he didn't know how to make her. She wanted to, but she wouldn't. Garrity knew that some boys could do that, could get a girl to go along, but he didn't quite seem to have enough personality, maybe not enough will, to convince her. He wondered how many of the others here were virgins. Gribble had called the Major a murderer. He wondered if Gribble was a virgin. He decided Gribble probably was. 
They passed the Caribou city limits. There was a large crowd there, and a news truck from one of the networks. A battery of lights bathed the road in a warm white glare. It was like walking into a sudden lagoon of sunlight, wading through it, and then emerging again. A fat newspaper man in a three-piece suit trotted along with them, poking his long-reach microphone at different walkers. Behind him, two technicians busily unreeled a drum of electric cable. How do you feel? Okay. I guess I feel okay. Are you feeling tired? Yeah, well, you know, yeah, but I'm, I'm still okay. What do you think your chances are now? I don't know. They're okay, I guess. I still feel pretty strong. He asked a big bull of a fellow, Scram, what he thought of the long walk. Scram grinned, said he thought it was the biggest fucking thing he'd ever seen, and the reporter made snippet motions with his fingers at the two technicians. One of them nodded back warily. Shortly afterwards, he ran out of microphone cable and began wending his way back towards the mobile unit, trying to avoid the tangles of unreeled cord. The crowd, drawn as much by the TV crew as the long walkers themselves, cheered enthusiastically. Posters of the Major were raised and lowered rhythmically on sticks, so raw and new they were still bleeding sap. When the cameras panned over them, they cheered more frantically than ever and waved to Aunt Betty and Uncle Fred. They rounded a bend and passed a small shop where the owner, a little man wearing a stained white, had set up a soft drink cooler with a sign over it which read, On the House for the Long Walkers courtesy of Ev's Market. A police cruiser was parked close by, and two policemen were patiently explaining to Ev, as they undoubtedly did every year, that it was against the rules for spectators to offer any kind of aid or assistance, including soft drinks, to the walkers. They passed by the Caribou Paper Mills Incorporated, a huge, soot-blackened building on a dirty river. The workers were lined up against the cyclone fences, cheering good-naturedly and waving. A whistle blew as the last of the walkers, Stebbins, passed by. And Garrity, looking back over his shoulder, saw them trooping inside again. Did he ask you? A strident voice inquired of Garrity. With a feeling of great weariness, Garrity looked down at Gary Barkovich. Did who ask me what? The reporter, Dumbo. Did he ask you how you felt? No, he didn't get to me. He wished Barkovich would go away. He wished the throbbing pain in the soles of his feet would go away. They asked me. Barkovich said, you know what I told him? No. I told him I felt great, Barkovich said aggressively. The rain hat was still flopping in his back pocket. I told him I felt real strong. I told him I was prepared to go on forever. And do you know what else I told him? Oh, shut up, Pearson said. Who asked you, long, tall, and ugly? Barkovich said. Go away, McVree said. You give me a headache. Insulted once more, Barkovich moved on up the line and grabbed Collie Parker. Did he ask you what? Get out of here before I pull your fucking nose off and make you eat it. Collie Parker snarled. Parkovich moved on quickly. The word on Collie Parker is that he was one mean son of a bitch. That guy drives me up the wall, Pearson said. He'd be glad to hear it, McVree said. He likes it. He also told the reporter that he planned to dance on a lot of graves. He means it, too. That's what keeps him going. Next time he comes around, I think I'll trip him, Olson said. His voice sounded dull and drained. Tut, tut, McVree said. Rule number eight, no interference with your fellow walkers. You know what you can do with rule eight, Olson said with a pallid smile. Watch out, McVree's grinned. You're starting to sound pretty lively again. By 7 p.m., the pace, which had been lagging very close to the minimum limit, began to pick up a little. It was cool, and if you walked faster, you kept warmer. They passed beneath a turnpike overpass, and several people cheered them around the mouthfuls of Duncan. 
7 p.m. in three. By 7 p.m., the pace, which had been lagging very close to the minimum limit, began to pick up a little. It was cool, and if you walked faster, you kept warmer. They passed beneath a turnpike overpass, and several people cheered around mouthfuls of Dunkin' Donuts from the glass-walled shop situated near the base of the exit ramp. We join up at the turnpike someplace, don't we? Baker asked. In Old Town, Garrity said, approximately 120 miles. Harkness whistled through his teeth. Not long after that, they walked into downtown Caribou. They were 44 miles from their starting point. That was chapter three of The Long Walk, the second short story contained within the pages of the Bachman books. And there's a lot going on, almost too much to mention. We started this chapter with 98, we're now at 96. We lost Zuck to blood loss from when he fell and hurt his knee. And then we lost Traven to stomach issues and pff, he had diarrhea and couldn't go on. That would be fucking horrible. God damn. Ah, that'd be horrible. And Garrity is a virgin, which is just hard to put together, but Things will become more clear as we continue on, and we will do that next time, because this has been Dr. Peace Theater, and my name is Dr. Dennis Business, and as always, my friend.